Hi, this is Ted Price from Insomniac Games, and today it was my distinct pleasure to talk to Chris Charla, who is the studio director of ID at Xbox. Chris shared his really fascinating journey from journalism to game development now to ID at Xbox, where he oversees many, many independent projects from developers of all sizes. Chris talked about the challenges facing independent developers, but how those challenges are offset by more opportunity than ever today. He has some great advice for developers of all types, and he shares thoughts on the future of gaming in general. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. in beautiful Dubrovnik at Dice Europe, and it's my pleasure to have Chris Charlie here, who is the Senior Director of ID Productions at Microsoft. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. We're overlooking the Adriatic Sea. It's like a crazy room to be recording a podcast in. It's beautiful, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've never been here, and the landscape and the ocean is kind of insanely yeah, it's uh, amazing. stunning. Have you been to Croatia No, before? no, I've never been to Croatia before, so... Did you go, well, actually, we went together on the yeah, yeah. Game of Thrones walk. Yeah, it was a good tour. I actually, I jumped in as soon as my plane landed, so I was still carrying all my luggage with me. So it was like, a, there's a lot of stairs in that walk. So there are. Carrying like a 40-pound backpack, too, was like, uh, it was a good workout. <laughs> did, it, did it remind you of any games as we were walking around? It rem- So it, two things. One is it totally reminded me of like an old-school adventure game because it was like, you're getting this tour and the guy was you know doing a really good job just narrating first of all talking a lot about game of thrones but then just narrating and then you're just in this area that's just packed with tourists and but in this beautiful old school environment so it felt like you're walking through assassin's creed only filled with tourists that's what i felt like yeah. too i got assassin's creed vibes the entire yeah. time but i just kept because there's all those tourists and you know any thriller movie you see just kept expecting at any moment Someone who's going to get kidnapped, or you know, Jason Bourne's going to show up, or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, it felt like a, like you were on an Assassin's Creed set, and you were like an NPC, and all the other NPCs were also like wearing shorts and carrying cameras. Like it was it was cool. Fortunately, I didn't think I don't think we saw anything that was no uh, no no out of Assassin's Creed. no no like video game or thriller movie moments happened. Do you feel like we were surrounded by video game players? I think we were. Yeah. It just yeah. It, we just you never know, yeah. right? Because everybody plays games today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't see anybody though paying any much attention to their phones. It was it was kind of a nice nice time to be away from the electronics where everybody was looking up versus down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was really cool. It, I mean, and it's just such a unique place in the world to just like see that and be a part of it and there were a lot of cats too, which was exciting. My like, wife took pictures of every single cat we saw. I don't know why. Yeah, I, just... I did too. I'm on a cat group chat, like it works. <laughs> so, uh, like, it, there's like a lot of, you know, you can upload pictures of your own cat, but you can only upload so many pictures. So then there's like some group chat pressure to make sure you're bringing fresh cats into the group chat. So, so bringing Dubrovnik cats to that chat must make you very special. Pre- pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so it's interesting you, you mentioned. Adventure, right? Uh, I, I, that just reminds me of what year was it, and when Adventure came out on the twenty six hundred. Oh, I, I don't think I even knew what the years were then. But yeah, yeah, like, it was when we were eight, ten, somewhere yeah. around there, right? Did you play the twenty six hundred? I up? I did play twenty six hundred. I didn't have one. That was like a go to the friend's house type of thing. But I never played Adventure until years later. What did you think of it when you picked it up for the first time? Uh, Adventure. Yeah. Well, Adventure, I thought was uh, it was amazing what uh warren robinet actually just like did with the limitations of the 2600 actually making a game that felt like you were exploring um but by the time i played adventure i'd already played ad and d on intellivision which was arguably like a better adventure game with more advanced hardware and i was also kind of where i got my start in games was actually the infocom games so Mm. like text adventures which were you know a lot more deep but certainly less like graphically You know, they're just text. What was your favorite Infocom adventure? So my 
my favorite one is probably well, I'm gonna say Lurking Horror, which was like oh. a like a college horror game set at kind of like a thinly disguised MIT. But like um, the first one I ever played was like um, was Zork, and so like I I have like a lot of fondness for like all of the Zork games. I I Zork was also my favorite for a while until Planetfall. Yeah, Planetfall is amazing. Yeah, I just I kind of wish somehow I could feel those same feelings that I had way back playing those text adventures where every, where it kind of forced you to be patient, right? And and spend a lot of time in each of the puzzles. I don't think I have the same patience anymore. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, so the thing that I got out of those games was, first of all, it, it did require patience to play. And second of all, like the feeling of discovery and exploration and specialness that felt like it, it it felt like you were uncovering something that was like truly secret, like something occult um, when you would, you know, play those games and do something in Zork or, or in Planetfall. Um, and I don't always get that feeling in games now. I've gotten it a few times since then, and, it, and it's amazing. Um, but uh, but I do think that the the games people play today, like that patience factor is there's just so much happening in the world today. Like people don't have the same attention span. What do you think games need to do to evoke that same excitement? I, I think that like um, some of it's just discovery. So the, the last time I really got that feeling was playing Fez. And I was really lucky when I played Fez in the, um, you know, I worked at Xbox at the time. So I got to play Fez. I try not to play games until they come out. Like I really don't like playing games in development unless I need to, because I want to just experience the, you know, the final vision. But Fez, I got like a token for like the week before it came out, but it's done. You know, it's already on the marketplace. And so when I started playing Fez, there was no one on earth I could ask about Fez, right? Like, and there was, you know, first of all, there's not really a map in the game. There's no, there was no, you know, no facts online. There was, if you were stuck, you were just stuck. But what there was was maybe like eight other people I knew who were playing it at work. And so you'd talk. So, so two things. One is to, to find out what to do or if you were stuck, you just had to talk to people and be like, I'm at that one place where, you know, you turn it and then there's a like green and then, you know. And, and so that was kind of fun um, just because there was no nomenclature around like how to navigate Fez. Uh, but then the other thing is, it's like I was just alone. And I was like discovering things. And so I remember there's one room and, and if you've played Fez, you may you may recognize this. When you turn the when you turn the view, um, suddenly there's writing, but it only appears like as the room is turning. And I, I get frustrated in games really easily. If I'm playing a game and I'm not having fun, I will just like walk away. I have a lot of games. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be out on a game in five minutes if I don't like it. I spent 45 minutes in this room just turning the camera back and forth, trying to look at this text. And this is, you know, when phones were, were way crappier. I think I had like a Blackberry. I'm trying to like record the screen with my Blackberry to like freeze frame it and figure out like what's written there. And it was like, like that was a moment where, you know, you really are, or you certainly feel like you're, you're exploring. I was like, like, I just found this thing. And like, other than Phil Fish and, you know, I don't know if anybody else in the world knows this is here. And like, that's like, that's just an amazing feeling. So when you were experiencing that growing up with game with the Infocom games and others, did that sort of drive you towards a, a career in games? Were you thinking about that? At the yeah, time? I had to say, like, I'm one of those people who, like, never considered doing anything but making video games. Really? Yeah. Like, even when I was 12, you know, my friend and I, we were like those annoying kids who would, like, call the companies like we would call Infocom and, you know, like try and get put through to somebody or just ask dumb questions. And like it never I don't think we ever talked about doing anything else. And, you know, obviously, you know, when you're in college and everything else, you think about doing uh, you think about maybe doing other things. But I never seriously thought about doing anything else. Well, OK, so you went to Boston University. Yep. And what were you studying there? Uh, I studied geography. Really? Yeah. Did that factor into a future game career in some way? I don't I don't think I, I studied geography because it's like it's well, two reasons. You know, I was like a like a, a social college attendee, and geography needed the least credits to to, <laughs> to graduate at the major. And um, but also, um, I just love information, and I love learning about things. And people hear you study geography, and they're like, "Oh, did you major in like where the state capitals are?" And like, not really. You know, <laughs> like geography is just about like the spatial distribution of information, and so. You, like economic geography to me is just like a fascinating subject. Like why are gas stations where they are? Why are our, why are all car dealerships next to each other? 
Um, and why, why are all car dealers so next to each other? They're all next to each other because if you like, despite the fact that they're next to their competitors, um, if there was one that was really far away and isolated, you might say like, "Oh, that's better because people won't be tempted to go to the compet you know, the competitor." But people are pretty rational; they want to shop for cars, so they're going to go to where they can shop for cars as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So it actually makes you get more customers coming through the door if you're next to the Kia dealer, if you're the you know Hyundai dealer, than you do being like isolated. So there's sort of a collective thing going on behind the scenes. Where yeah. Yeah, they all exactly. agree that we need to be together. Yeah, and they, sometimes they all agree, and you know, you and 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 now like that definitely happens. Like a, you know, some development company will build an auto mall and get like all these car dealers to be like tenants. But it also happens just completely organically. Like one of the things I don't know if this still exists because I don't know if this industry is here this way, but um, all commercial photography studios used to be in the same part of town. So like in San Francisco, when I lived in San Francisco, like every commercial photography studio was in the same place south of Market. And that's because, so they're not competing for customers, but they're sort of competing for freelancers because, you know, different freelance photographers will be there and, and you know, the photography store is there. And so they end up just putting their studios there because that's where everybody else is. And it it's completely organic. Uh, but anyway, it, it's just, it's like a fascinating subject to learn about. What kind of career does one generally have after studying geography? So you can kind of do a couple different things. Like one of the things you can do is figure out like where to put the next Starbucks, which okay. is also really interesting because you're not just looking at space. You're also looking at like time and friction of getting places and like where people go. And so you work a lot with these things called geographic information systems and just sort of figure out where to, you know, where to locate businesses. And the other thing you can do is like probably work for the government looking for like, you know, terrorist training sites and satellite analysis and stuff like that. Did you consider any of those? Yeah, yeah, I thought about both of those. And they're, they're both like really, really interesting, but like video games are more fun, so. So what, what, how did you make the jump then? So I knew as I was graduating, as I was, you know, getting ready to be done with college, like I knew that I really loved video games and I also really loved magazines. At the time I was, you know, or I still do, I made like lots of fanzines and always worked on magazines and stuff. And I was like, okay, I, I I love magazines. I love video games. I also really loved punk rock music and the, the best scene at the time was in Berkeley. And I was like, that's where, you know, okay, San Francisco's where like video games are. There's tons of magazines there. It's where, you know, Operation Ivy came from and Crimp Shrine and Green Day, like boom. So I just, um, I did the classic thing where I left college and then just like moved across the country. I like, you know, like literally with like, I think I had like $300 or something. I just remember thinking my girlfriend was super rich because she had $1,700. And um, she also moved out there with no job or no, you know, and um, and uh, and then just like got lucky and um, it's sort of like I did a couple things. Like I squatted in a abandoned bus depot for a few nights. And, you know, you know, like when you're just out of college, like you're, you can do whatever you want, right? So well, there's not a whole lot of context to draw on, right? Yeah. In terms of real world, so. Yeah, and I, I knew I wanted to set up in Berkeley, so, but it took a little while to like find somebody who'd rent me an apartment when I didn't have a job. And so, you know, it did all the, all that kind of fun stuff. And, uh, but anyway, I eventually got a job at a magazine, like a Macintosh magazine, and it was their entertainment editor. And then that turned into a job um, working at Next Generation, which was a video game magazine. Well, not just a game magazine i re i recall it being the definitive game magazine if you wanted to find out about if you wanted to get an unbiased review right from a magazine next gen was where you went at least that's what i recall yeah i, I mean i loved it like it was it's a time i mean i i love magazines i love every kind of magazine and video game magazines at the time back in the mid 90s they were really for kids right and they had this like insane you know graphic design of just like you know color vomit all over the pages which is which is awesome. Like I still look back on that super fondly. But Next Gen took like a totally different tack. Is it was basically the U.S. version of Edge, which is yep. still in publication. And so it was very serious. It took games really, really seriously. And it had like I, I still think beautiful, just like very minimalist um, graphic design that just let like the the screenshots be the stars and just had really nice like uh, all um, you know sharp ninety degree edges in terms of all its graphic design. And so I, I was. Uh, Super lucky to get a job there. Well, I remember talking to you pretty frequently. That's when we met. Like, yeah. we met. I was just thinking about it. Uh, I think we met at the second E3, which was my first E3 working for Next Gen. 
And um, at the time, like Universal, like invited all the journalists to go on a tour of Universal Studios before E3. And I remember for us, we were like, oh, this is so cool. Universal's inviting us to do this thing. But like, it's really far from downtown and nobody had cars and there wasn't Uber then or anything. But anyway, somehow we figured that out. And um, and I think we met on uh, um, like on the little tram ride yep, going through right. Universal Studios, like Mark Cerny introduced us. And I think we were trying to show off Disruptor. At that yeah, yeah. And that was part of our marketing campaign was, hey, take a trip to Universal Studios and we won't show you the game, but we'll show you Universal Studios. Yeah. And maybe at some point you can write a review about the game. And yeah. And Mark was talking about the game. He's like, oh, you need to, you know. And so, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. And then I, was Disruptor the first FPS on console? I I think there was, I think we were beat to the punch by something on 3DO. Like PO'd maybe? Yeah, or? that's that's what it was, yeah. Okay, but um, it was right, it was like one of the very first. It was one of the first, yeah. And it's a super good game. Like, Well, thanks, yeah, we like, we enjoyed making it. We learned a lot about, um, a, a lot about a lot. But that was back in the era when most of the games used video for cutscenes. Remember Warhawk and, uh, gosh, Wing Commander and... We were we were taking inspiration from those because we filmed all of the cutscenes, not on the lot at Universal, but in these really kind of low rent places on Santa Monica Boulevard. Oh, that's awesome! And it, but yeah, that was those those were the days back in the, the the early days of E3, and so you were so Next Gen was a big thing. I mean, that was sort of that was the industry mag that I remember, and you were heading it up for a while. Yeah, I started out as like a um, associate editor, and then I was features editor, which is like an amazing job because I got to this is kind of pre-internet or just at the dawn of the internet. So when you wrote a feature, you would like, and there was just magazines, there were no websites. Like you would get to research it for like a month, you know, and it was like amazing. I'd be like, okay, go learn everything about like you know next gen graphics techniques. Yeah. Like what is mip mapping? You know, like, go call somebody at Silicon Graph, you know. It was it was such a fun job because you just got to learn so much and then just trying to distill that down in a way that was like really readable. And then um, post next gen, I went and started uh, IGN, like right as websites were kind of getting off the ground. And then um, and then uh, yeah, IGN was fun. I didn't work there for very long, um, but then uh, came back to next gen and then Dreamcast, and then I split and went and did development. That's a there's a lot there in that in those two sentences so <laughs> yeah was, but when you okay so let's just jump to going let's talk about development so you went to go do development so how did you make that sort of mental switch had you always wanted it to be in development yeah i mean i think i'd always wanted to work in games and game journalism was like super awesome because i like i said I, I love magazines i still i make a fanzine every month to this day and um um and it was an amazing education and got to meet so many people so quickly like I think I worked in journalism for a total like six or seven years and I basically met every single person in the industry I'd ever heard of and you know got introduced to tons and tons of new people and the only person I never met was like John Carmack but like everybody else Romero you Mark Cerny like Shu like I met everybody and which so was really really awesome but but I did always want to make games and um you know, I could also sort of see the writing on the wall for what was happening with games journalism and and um, didn't want to stay in it too, too, too long, even though it was really, really fun. And so I, for a little while, actually moonlighted and helped make clacks on Game Boy Color. And that was kind of like a nice taste of that. Was, first of all, that was just a fun project to work on because it was all an assembly. It had one of the strangest bugs I've ever encountered in my life. So you were doing coding in assembly? I wasn't doing coding at all, no. But I was I was producing, I knew Clax really, really well. And so I was like the producer and working with um, Mike Micah, who had previously worked at NextGen and then had already left to go into development. But I was doing a lot of like just debugging and paying attention to what was going on. And at one point we found this incredibly strange bug and there's no like debugger or anything like for Game Boy, so we had to do everything on a whiteboard, and um, and so just literally have like the registers and the whiteboard, and just writing the contents of the registers of you know what's going on in each line, um, just to try and figure out like what was going on. There was this super strange math bug with the way Clax works. If people don't know, Clax is like a like it's like a match three puzzle game where you're sort of setting tiles down, but you can get all these combos where you you have like three in a row horizontally and vertically and diagonally, uh, and 
we scored it logically, uh, you know, because you, you get like bonuses if it's like the second clacks and everything like that. But it didn't score the way the arcade game scored. The arcade game scored totally different. Well, it turns out Dave Akers, who uh, made the game, it was pretty new to see. And so he wrote clacks in like a weekend in Amiga Basic. And then he, you know, got the basic core logic of Clax done in a weekend at Amiga Basic. Like, went to work the next week. They took Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters and just, like, remmed out all the gameplay. But it's everything else is Escape from the Planet of the Robot Monsters and just wrote a new, like, core gameplay loop. And he basically translated it line for line from Amiga Basic to a, to, to C. And I, I can't remember 100%. It is... I think he might have had comments that had the Amiga basic lines like next to the C. So you can sort of, sort of see what's going on. So anyway, we had this bug. We could not get it to score correctly. You know, I'm, sh you know, just, and, it, and some of the things you had to do were like pretty advanced clacks techniques to like find these uh, places where it wasn't scoring right. I'm showing it to Mike. He's like baffled. I'm baffled. This is when all the, you know, whiteboard disassembly or whatever was happening. And, um, and finally Mike just took like quick basic and wrote the scoring routine again in Quick Basic, just like really mirroring what Dave had done initially in Amiga Basic, and it scored perfectly. And so we we're like, well, we don't know why this is happening. You know, like math operations like don't really change, like language. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this is this doesn't make any sense at all. And then he, I think he either translated the lines directly to assembly uh, from Quick Basic, or he found like a little Quick Basic, a little Basic interpreter. Um, to, that was in assembly and, and used that. And it, anyway, then it scored fine. We like shipped the game the next day. And then like to this day, like have no clue why that worked. And <laughs> which I guess is the, you know, at least on all the coding I've done, they're like, I don't know why this isn't working. I'll just write it again. And then it works. And I don't think about it. And I move on. It's like, that's kind of scary. Yeah. Right. It is you scary. Put a game perfect. out and you have no idea why it's, yeah. <laughs> Why it isn't crashing all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but Clax works. It scores perfectly to the arcade. And it's uh, it was a fun game to work on. That's right. So that was your first one. And then yeah. and you so you produced that. Yeah, I produced that just kind of as I was like I knew that the the game thing was or the magazine thing was kind of ending. And then I went uh, over to that company full time afterwards and uh, was like a producer on games for I was there for like ten years. So I did it was a really small company. So when I started, you know, everybody wears a lot of hats, which is like a great uh, education. Like I started and they were like, there's a spool of cat five. There's a crimping tool, like the servers over there, you know, figure it out, you know, so, um, but, but I did, um, production and then I went more into biz dev and pitching games and, um, and then, then I went to Microsoft. Okay. But I, I the development part of this is, is fascinating because you're coming from a journalist background, right, and getting into development. Were there certain things that you brought that you felt were unique to the team because of your background uh, re reviewing I, I games? Th I think, yeah, like I, I brought more of a sense of like we need to think about like what this game is going to be like at the end and what people are going to think about this game. And, you know, you're always making games under, you know, incredible constraints, whether it's time or budget or, or whatever. And like making sure everybody understood that like nobody who plays this game knows or cares about the restraints that we're making it under is something that I think like everybody who makes games has to has to learn that like you know like oh we made this game and you know it's getting dinged for x y and z but they don't know a b and c but like that's right they don't and they don't need to and they don't care and they don't they shouldn't care right like people should just judge the game on its merit so I think that was something I kind of um had right at the beginning um but I will say you know I feel like in a lot of ways I learned more my first like month making games than I had in like seven years of, of kind of talking about them because you really learn, oh, there are these A, B, and C constraints. And like this is like, you know, every question you ever had about why a game wasn't good, you know, has now been answered. And nobody starts out to make a game that's bad, right? Like every game that was started was going to be like a 80 plus Metacritic game. And you just sort of see what happens. And the company I worked at did a huge amount of like license games, which, you know, you really learn about constraints doing license games. What what were some of the challenges working with license source? I, so the big thing back then was just that um, there was still like, I think this has totally changed now, but there wasn't as much of a positive relationship between games and like say linear media where license might be coming from. So people were afraid to do something like share the script for a movie. So then you'd have to make a game for a movie 
with a really tight time frame, but no one would tell you anything about the movie, hmm. which like now you hear that and it just seems silly. And you can imagine, you know, suddenly like the answers for like why so many bad licensed games are just running left to right shooting, regardless of what the plot is, um, you know, you know, suddenly starts to make sense. But um, those are some of the kind of constraints that we dealt with. And, you know, there was one game I worked on where we spent, you know, probably 40 percent of the budget on the game on like a virtual pet mode. And then and this was all approved by the publisher and then well into development, they were like, oh, that character doesn't have a pet. So you, you can't use, you know, like 40 percent of what you've just done. And uh, we're like, did you read the design <laughs> document? And they're because you approved it and they're like, ah, oh, well, they don't have a pet. And so you just, you know, like now, like make a whole new game in like three weeks. Like those are kind of. How did the team react to that? Uh, you know. Poorly, I imagine. Yeah, it wasn't a big team, actually. Um, and we ended up doing like a lot of level design, just like driving to the publisher's office. They were in L.A. and we were in the Bay Area. And it was right. It was soon after 9-11. So it was actually just faster to drive than to take a plane. And so we would just like drive down with like the laptop, just doing level design. So we'd get down there and show the levels and then drive back and do level design the whole way back. It was uh, it was kind of like I, I don't know if games really still get made that way. It was like a different it was a little bit of a different time, but it was definitely like a a gritty kind of blue collar game development experience. Well, maybe. I mean, you work with a lot of smaller companies, right, where game development isn't necessarily prescript pres- prescribed. Everybody's yeah. figuring it out on the on the fly, right? Yeah, and that's what's that is exactly what's so fun about it, right? Is it like, you know, it's interesting because I, I worked in independent development and you you worked in independent development just in the in the era when you know you and being an independent developer meant that you were constantly pitching to make basically somebody else's game. And yeah. you know, sometimes you got lucky and got to make your own game and, and if you had success like you guys did, then you got to do do more and more of that. But a lot of what you were doing was just, you know, dancing to somebody else's tune and it was still really really satisfying because you always you know got to design the game yourself but um but it was uh, it was just sort of a different time so then you moved over to microsoft yeah so we my company ended up doing um a ton of xbox live arcade games and okay. to me that was like the most amazing thing like digital distribution you know today it's like it's hard to even understand. We're we're in such a world now where digital distribution is so ubiquitous. It's hard to understand like what a shift that was in the in the industry. Going from mass ROMs and CDs to like digital distribution was just like a unfathomable change. And I, I know that like when I bought my my first Xbox, so I bought Xbox 360. I had the OG Xbox, but I bought Xbox 360, and um, I had like waited out in the freezing rain with no jacket for like three hours to get one like outside this best buy in western massachusetts and uh um and i got a game with it and you know i come home i think i'm about to get pneumonia um we hooked the game up to my mother-in-law's like you know old four by three tv that has like made out of wood you know and um and then put the game in and it was like a ps2 port and it was not like a good ps2 port it was a really disappointing ps2 port and my my wife is just looking at me like, what, why you just spent how much money on this? And this game looks like, and I was like thinking to myself, like, what did I do? And then, um, we get on the internet, like, which was tricky at grandma's house, trust me. Um, but got on the internet and actually downloaded some of the first XBLA games. Cause there were XBLA games available day one and they were awesome. And all of a sudden, you started to see like, oh, wow, this is really the potential of the system. And at the time, the 360 had this feature where every game had a demo and it would auto, you could set in the early days, you could just set it to auto download the demos like every Wednesday and it would just have new demos downloaded and you would come home and it'd be, just be like these new games to play. And it was like, it was bonkers. And, uh, and I just remember thinking like, this is, this is what's next gen about this system. Obviously, the 360 had way better graphics than the machines that came before it. But to me, what was really next gen about it was like the fact that you could just download games. And for creators, the fact that you could like basically like now you didn't have to rely on someone else to publish your game. You still technically needed a publisher. Typically it was like Microsoft Studios. But um, but uh, you and you also didn't need to provide, you know, $60 worth of content to justify that that disc price. You could provide like just the correct amount of content like 
it was like so freeing that we saw that's when we saw this just cambrian explosion of like new games and new game types and i think like i always you know all the stuff was kind of bubbling and was was in the works but i always date it back to um like when it first kind of burst into the cultural consciousness is that like that 2008 summer of arcade where you had like castle crashers and um you know all those games just like you know braid like all ship within like a five week period um was just like I think Castle Crashers was Amazing. played more at my house than almost any game. Yeah. Over the last, and, if I add up all the years that we've had and, consoles. And can you house. imagine in that era, the, this sort of pre like digital distribution era, the behemoth going around and trying to pitch Castle Crashers oh, yeah. to, to the publishers of the day? Like it, it just, it never would have happened. And you know, the fact that they were able to like ship that themselves or braid like John Blow, like. And, you know, he, he doesn't get enough credit, in my opinion, for how much of a pioneer he was because he was working on Braid for years before it shipped. Mm -hmm. He was working on Braid and had this idea for Braid before there was going to be any way to really distribute it, you know, on, on console anyway. And, you know, the fact that he got all the success that he got, I think it's like so well deserved. Um, but Castle Crashers, it's like, I mean... And it's still it's still going it's, strong, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's now it's out now out on Switch. Yeah, I think it's, right? it's if it didn't ship on Switch yet, it's switch shipping oh, within like out. a week or two. That's right. Like, okay. yeah, it's amazing. So, so those are the games that you saw were generating sort of this new level of excitement among indie developers, right? And did that make you? want to go talk to Microsoft or how, how did that work? Yeah. So I, I had had a friend who went to Microsoft and, and, and I was all in on XBLA and I think our company at the time, I think we did like 25 or 30 or 40 XBLA games and PSN games. And, uh, and I, to me, it's just the most exciting content type because you could just make small content. Yeah. Um, and it could be really good, but it didn't have to be huge and you could ship a lot of games and I, I don't have like the world's best attention span. So getting to work on a lot of little things like really worked for me. And then I just got a call from my friend at Microsoft saying like, hey, get up here. And to me, it was like, um, you know, it was I had worked in development for like 10 years. So it was, you know, I'd, I'd learned a lot and it's always good to keep learning. So now going to the other side was going to to learn a ton more. And it was such an exciting I thought important content type that it was like a, a good time to make the switch. So I moved up to Microsoft. And what did you start doing? So I started out as the um, portfolio director for Xbox Live Arcade for for Microsoft Studios. So I went from you know pitching games to hearing pitches, and uh, that was really exciting because I, you know, I I think as a developer, you know, you come to conferences and you. You, you spend a lot of time, you know, at the time you spend a lot of time pitching to publishers who you know, could be a little scary or stone faced or whatever. But then, you know, afterwards you'd go to the bar and drink and, you know, hang out with all your fellow developers and and talk about, you know, development issues. And I, and I, I always felt like maybe a little bit more kinship with with them than, than, than some of the publishers we were working with at the time. And so to suddenly get to like flip that where now my job is actually talking to all these all the cool kids at the bar, you know what I mean? And, and I guess, yeah, now I'm the suit, but, but, um, but like getting to actually work with those folks and, and, you know, you know, seeing like all the cool stuff that was out there was, uh, that was just, it was awesome. And it's still awesome because you know, I'm basically still doing the same thing. So well, how did, how did it evolve into ID at Xbox? So, um, Xbox Live Arcade, uh, was going really good. And then as we started to get towards the end of the 360 era and into Xbox one, we knew we kind of had to change how we were working with independent developers. And we got, um, a lot of knocks in the media and really on Twitter from, from independent developers. And it was kind of sad because I, I look back on it and you know, Microsoft had really pioneered and created this space for independent developers to flourish with Xbox uh, Live Arcade. But the, the, you know, the scene, the independent development scene just grew so much faster than, than we, I think, realized. And it matured so much more quickly than we were capable of, like, sort of harnessing. And so it, it, the, by the end of the 360 era, you know, you, you needed a publisher to be able to publish on Xbox One or sorry, excuse me, on Xbox 360. That was not popular with developers who, you know, now are used to publishing on Steam, used to publishing on PlayStation. And then on Xbox, if they weren't able to publish through Microsoft Studios, they would have to work with like a third party publisher who might take a revenue cut just for providing the, you know, quote unquote publishing slot. It was, we got dinged a lot for that. So we knew we needed to, um, 
change how we were working with developers. And so as we, in the run up to Xbox One, a lot of different people came together to say like, hey, how do we, you know, like, this is like not just an exciting content area, it's becoming like the most exciting content area. Um, and games like Minecraft, which today are, you know, institutions at the time were indie games, you know, and we're like, this is, this is awesome. Like we gotta figure out how to do this. And so um, we came up with a bunch of ideas. Um, uh, one of the ideas that we took forward, I remember distinctly, we pitched to Phil, um, and Phil was just like, this idea is terrible. Like, um, like this isn't going to work. And um, he was like, you know, you need to be like tons more open. Because we really weren't, I think, even then, we knew we needed to be more open, but we, we were like afraid to go all the way. And Phil was just like, he needs to, you know, go rethink this. So we rethought it and we came back. And what we came up with then was, like what ID at Xbox is today. So it's, you know, it's like a program that anyone can join um, that's completely, uh, you know, open to join and um, and be part of and that just works to make getting your game onto Xbox One as easy as humanly possible. What specific barriers for indie developers did it erase? So I think the biggest one was just platform access. And, you know, and, and it just seems silly to talk about today. But at the time, the biggest barrier was, you know, getting dev kits, like getting on the platform. And so that was the first thing we had to just deal with. And so we, I think we came up with a good system. So developers apply to the program. Um, they tell us what game they want to work on. Um, and then if, if they don't have dev kits already, we send them two dev kits at, at no charge. And then, and then they're just off to the races. And we provide development support and everything else, you know, like if, if somebody needs help, although typically most developers don't need a lot of help when they're making their games today. And then we start to provide um, a lot more help when it comes to CERT, especially somebody's first game. Getting through CERT can be, it's not super hard, but there can be gotchas. And so try and help people with that. And then um, um, provide basically promotional amplification for the promotion that the developers are doing. I mean, ultimately they're the publishers, but like, we want to try and just you know rise up as many games as we can and it's been interesting over the um you know six years now that id has been going like the places where we can help and where our help can have the most benefit has definitely changed right mm -hmm. so in the early days in 2013 it was all about platform access it was about like sending people dev kits and and you know that was kind of you know i don't want to say it was all we had to do we certainly had to help them get onto the system but like that was like the most important thing as times changed and it's become you know easier and easier to get on the platform um you know it's, you know middleware has made it you know you know really straightforward to get your game developed and even start to become you know more straightforward the places where we can help and the places where developers you know can use our help has become you know much more in promotion in discovery and then i would say the the third place is really providing information so devs today i mean a, a typical independent developer today they might be heads down for two, three, four, six years on their game. And so when they are getting ready to ship, the market is completely changed from the last time they shipped a game. And so what, you know, the, the script for what works and how you promote the game is, you know, completely changed. And so letting developers know, like, what are the current best practices for promotion? Um, and then also just letting them know, like, here's what's you know happening with sales like here's the trends we're seeing um are things that i think can really meaningfully affect like a developer's commercial success and you know for us um that's the place commercial success is a place where our interests and the developer's interests like really closely overlap like the nice thing one really nice thing about id at xbox is like we make all our money off the platform royalty right so we, we are only successful to the extent devs are successful so we can you know really which i think is a really nice like merging of of interests um and so we try and provide a lot of information about how to maximize your success but at the same time as we're providing all that we're also super clear that i always need to be careful about how i say this like in the nicest possible way like we don't care about the commercial success like you know so if a dev wants to make a game that you know is not designed to be commercially successful and i think there's a lot of definitions for how success is um you know thought of by devs there's commercial success for sure but there's also creative success there's artistic success there's critical success and we're, we're totally agnostic to what, what a producer or what a developer is, is going for like we want there to be a huge variety of content on the system and that doesn't come from everybody chasing the same mm -hmm. kind of game so 
we provide a lot of information about commercial stuff um, so that devs kind of understand it and know what's going on there. But, you know, we're as excited about a game that maybe, you know, isn't designed to be commercially successful as we are about one that that is. And so you give them the developers data to help help them choose their their direction. Yeah, exactly. Like like it, it's really we'll talk about like kind of like what trends we're seeing in the market, you know, what what genres are doing well, what genres seem like they've maybe like overproduced. Um, and then we'll also give uh, data about um, just really like a lot of times very Xbox specific uh, sales stuff to mm-hmm. just to maximize their success on Xbox. One one I've talked about in the past is we'll tell developers, you know, really clearly like Friday is the best day to ship a digital game on Xbox because you're going to be in you know new releases. It's really well trafficked. You're going to be in new releases all weekend, all the way till the following Tuesday. So that's like the best day. And then, you know, then we'll tell them we just told everyone in the game industry Friday is the best day to ship. So like you might want to ship on Wednesday because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of game shipping on Friday. And then it's even things like, you know, I think on PlayStation, most games ship on Tuesday. Yeah. And on Xbox, like retail games ship on Tuesday and on, on Switch, I think most games ship on Thursday. And so sometimes we'll have devs who want to um, mirror those ship dates because they, they want to be shipping at the same time on all platforms. And in that case, sometimes it's an education of letting people know, like, we've never had a single complaint because a game shipped on Wednesday and it shipped on PlayStation on Tuesday. Like, don't don't worry about that. Y- you know, and, and, and I think like devs are really well-meaning, so they're trying to do the right thing by every platform, but they're pro- they might be hurting their platform sales. You know, they should ship on Tuesday on PlayStation, but if they ship on Tuesday on Xbox, the same day as, you know, like four different special editions of three different retail games come out, they might get lost in the new releases section. So just come out on Wednesday. Like nobody's going to stress about it. Nobody complains. Microsoft's not going to stress about it. And so giving that kind of information, especially to like um, devs who are coming to Xbox for the first or second time, I think like really can help um, just smooth their path. And, you know, for us, that's what it's, it's always just about like making the path onto platform uh, as smooth as humanly possible. And I think once we do that, we know we have great players. We know we have a really heavily transaction uh, audience. And so we know that the sales are there, Mm -hmm. um, the sales potential is there. It's just about helping devs like maximize it. Well, that sort of leads to discoverability, right? And so that's all what you're talking about is how do I make my game more discoverable? What other things do you help developers with in that realm? So I think the biggest place, and and I agree, discoverability is like by far like the biggest challenge of our of our kind of age is um, like uh, we do a lot of work um, just to promote the games, and so that that's everything from you know YouTube. We just started a, our own YouTube channel mm-hmm. to help promote games um, to um, uh, you know blog posts and tweets and everything like that, but also shows like. E3 and and Gamescom and PAX and just making sure that um, developers who are working on independent games and coming through the ID to, ID to Xbox program have the same ability to um, uh, get you know Microsoft's top level promotion as any other game. So for E3 is probably the best example. So um, you know when ID first started. Um, we had some time on stage at E3, which was awesome. Yeah, I remember and, that. I yeah. mean, it was a really it, awesome presentation because for the first time, it felt like indie developers were on the world stage in a way they hadn't been before. Yeah, it was it was amazing. And we, we put all the games from independent developers together in their own section. And we did that for like, I think, three years running. Um, and today we don't do that anymore. But the reason we don't do that anymore is because there's so many games from independent developers that that section would be like <laughs> too long for the show. And, and, and also the quality of the games is so high and our, compu- our consumers are, you know, sophisticated enough to understand what they're looking at, that putting those games to, all next to each other actually sometimes makes, it makes like less sense for the show because the games are so tonally different. And so to now at E3, like time-wise, games from independent developers get more time than they ever have. But they're, other than the, the uh, montage that we do every year, they're not like put next to each other. Yeah. They just put where they kind of belong in the show. And to me, that's like a, it's a huge win. Um, but but if you count like minutes of games from ID and Xbox developers that are in E3, it's like staggering how high that is. And so to me, that's like the, that's like the biggest, one of the biggest things that we do to help promote the games. And one of the things I'm most proud about one of the, in terms of how we run the program is that we make sure that Every game in the program has an equal chance to like 
kind of compete for that that stage spot. How do you do that if you have thousands of games? Yeah, so we have tons and tons of games in development, more than a thousand games in development. It's there's no like shortcut. What we do is we send an email out four or five months before E3 saying like E3 is coming. If you want a chance to participate, like send us a video by this date. And then on, you know, on that date, we, we get everybody in a room and we'll spend days watching videos and we get as broad a selection. You know, obviously we have to keep things confidential. You can't invite strangers, but from the ID program, we get as you know, broad and diverse a selection of people in the room as possible. We look at every single video that gets sent to us and and evaluate it. And, you know, unfortunately, of course, we can't include everybody, but we make sure everybody has a, a shot to be included. And um, from the videos, and I think like this year, I think we spent like four plus days looking at videos. So probably like 35 hours total, maybe, maybe 30 hours total looking at videos. Then we, um, you know, depending on where a game is in development, we might ask for a build, um, you know, from some of the games. And we, we narrow down and have like all the, it's exactly as painful as you imagine it would be. And everybody has, you know, games that they're championing and they don't all make it in, you know, and, and then from there, we, we narrow down a slate that we, you know, bring to a, another meeting where the same thing is happening at large with every game that could be on stage. And, uh, you know, we present games and, and see what happens. It's, it's like a, um, it, it's really one of the most fun parts of the job because that like four days or however long it takes, like you feel like you get a really good view of like everything that's coming out. And we've definitely had games that, you know, didn't make it one year and didn't make it a second year, but like made it the third year. And like, that feels kind of cool too. Do you do the same thing when you decide who's going to be front and center in the store? Uh, similar. It's, it's not exactly the same, but, um, but yeah, like we, Again, we're just constantly looking at the games that are coming and trying to figure out like what what are things that we think are going to resonate with players or, or or what's something that players aren't going to expect, but when they see, they're going to be delighted by. You know, Cuphead's a perfect example there that I don't think anybody, nobody was asking for like a hand animated 1930s, you know, run and gun. But when you see it, you suddenly realize like that's the game you've, you know, completely been needing for like the last, you know, 100 years or whatever. And so, um, so we, we spend a lot of time making sure, and our store team is really, really good about just trying to make sure that they're constantly surfacing different things so that when you go to the store, of course, you're going to see the big hits, but you're also going to see things um, that, that are, you know, are going to be interesting to you. Okay. So do developers in the program also do things that outside of Microsoft's venue or, or arena? where they're they're streaming their own thing or they're going out and ta- contacting influencers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 not a publishing relationship. I mean, they they're publishers, they're publishing onto Xbox, but right. we're not um con- at all in any way controlling like who they talk to or what they do. You know, they're they're the publishers, so they're really right. in charge of promoting their games. So, you know, something like um packs, you know, developers just go to packs cuz they think it's cool or they think it's useful. And, you know, they don't, they don't ask us permission. You know, a couple times we've um, published little guides of like all the ID ga- or you know, all the games that are coming to Xbox that are at PAX. It's actually can't even do it anymore because it's just too many. Um, but yeah, no, developers do, you know, promotion on their own. We, we look at our job is to try and like um, work with our channels like the like the Dash and like E3 um, to, to, to promote games. But that's in addition to what developers are doing on their own. Has anything surprised you about some of the approaches people have taken? Oh, yes. Like, I'm trying to think of an example. I'm always surprised. It's always amazing to see, like, the different ways that um, developers, um, you know, burst into the cultural consciousness. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally fail thinking of good examples right now. But, um, but yeah, I'm, we're, we're always surprised by both, like, what games are coming, how developers are marketing them, and just how developers like um, um, break out. There's just no formula. And so it's um, it's always fascinating. And then it's always like, you know, tough when you see like a good game, like struggle to, to break out. Yeah. Well, you know, what fascinates me about the program is that here we have super creative, very small teams working, taking some real creative risks on games working with one of the largest companies in the world that is not known uh, first and foremost for games, right? Now, today, Microsoft and and Xbox have become a massive brand. But prior to that, you know, Microsoft wasn't. How do you 
create those connections between a tiny group who may just feel like corporate culture is toxic and this giant corporation? How do you shepherd them through that? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's, that's really our job. And so the, there's no, again, there's like, there's just no shortcuts there. So we spend tons and tons of time going out and like meeting with developers um, at, you know, tons and tons of shows. And, um, and you hope that eventually, and, and for us, luckily, this happened a little bit, is that, you know, eventually your reputation starts to precede you. And, you know, and, and you know, if, if we're to the extent we're doing a good job and definitely to the extent we're doing a bad job, like people know. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it it's like one of the cool things about the program is that, you know, I, I think um, Twitter is, has a lot of negative parts. Right. But one of the positive parts of it is that, you know, exactly what people think of you. So if you're messing up, you know. Right. And and. Um, building this program in an era of social media has meant that we can't like, like if we wanted to, which we don't, like we can't be sneaky. You know what I mean? We have to be, you know, completely transparent, completely forthright. And we work really hard to do that. So people know, they know exactly what's going on with the program. They know exactly what our goals are. They know exactly what their opportunities are. And then people see those opportunities coming true and people see that we're, you know, doing what we say and people see that, you know, if we make a commitment to a developer that you're going to be on the dash for three days and the first 30 days of launch, like they can see those three days and the first 30 days of launch and, oh, wow, maybe it's like five days. And, you know, and so um, it's, there's no substitute for going out there and talking to people and, and yet all the time. And, and of course, um, we meet people who are like, I don't know who to talk to at Microsoft or they're intimidated to talk to Microsoft or they, um, you know, um, are, you know, just it's like a big giant company. And and so when you're working with a really small developer, you have to be really cognizant that like they may not know who you are. They may only know that Microsoft's a big giant company. And so you just have to be like really like direct and transparent and, you know, try and like you know, I, I'm lucky because I was a developer. I have like, I think, I think still like a good, I have a lot of empathy for like the, you know, like where developers are and, um, you know, and whether that's just talking to them about where they are in their journey or whether it's doing something like, you know, I approve all the royalties for ID and Xbox games. And I can tell you, um, there's no way to get me to do something faster than when the email shows up that says like, there's royalties to approve because I know like the faster I approve the royalties, the faster the dev gets paid. And like, I know how important that is. So like when that it's a color coded on my email too, like when the little, you know, color coded email saying like royalties for approval comes up, like, boom, I drop everything and go and approve the royalties. Um, and I think, I think, you know, I, mean, I don't know how many developers know I do that, but like, I think developers appreciate that. We really are a developer focused program. Everybody who's on the team and the team's about 25 people worldwide um, is passionate about developers uh, a lot of people come from a development background and um and we just work really hard to help devs and i think at a certain point you know you, you can't fake that do you know what i mean like uh you you're it, people either believe it or they don't but i don't think you can trick someone into thinking you care about them when you don't you know what i mean and so uh um yeah so that's what we do i think that's fantastic i mean i it's unusual and especially for Microsoft, right? Because uh, that's just not how a lot of people perceive Microsoft 10 years ago. So uh, speaking of that, how have you seen the program evolve? I mean, certainly you've got more, it seems like more and more developers are getting the message, right? And are learning from, that you guys are the real deal. You're going out meeting with people all the time. Is, are things continuing to change in terms of how you work with the developers or what you offer? Yeah, I think I think they are like we um, so we're constantly evolving just kind of what we're doing on the on the back end. And, and it's not like maybe exciting to talk about, but like we're constantly looking for ways to like shave off time for developers. So if, if they need, if, if we can save a developer, you know, five hours of work, that's just work to get on Xbox. Like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's like five hours they can have back in their life to make the game better or do whatever. And then you look in aggregate across like a thousand games, you know, saving huge amounts of time for the industry. And, and, that, and that's kind of cool. So we do a lot of work there. Um, and that's always changing, you know, like any other platform holder, you know, our, our back end, you know, processes change like regularly ingestion tools and everything like that. So just trying to make sure those transitions um, to new tools are super easy with, um, 
you know, new hardware coming on board or new programs or that kind of thing. We just work to make sure um, all our devs know um, exactly what's going on and how they can take advantage. And we do, um, like all platform holders, we do like a lot of, um, you know, closed door developer events where, that are under NDA where we talk about, this is where we talk about things like sales and talk about, you know, what's coming up on a hardware basis. So we're constantly doing that. I think that the interesting thing to me has been um, over the five or six years that ID has been around, just watching the, the evolution of independent developers and how increasingly like sophisticated they are. And, you know, you, you constantly have new blood coming in. So there's constantly new studios starting, whether it's people leaving AAA or just, you know, joining games from outside the industry. So there's always education there with those with those new folks. But the, the folks who've been there and are on their sophomore game and their third or their fourth game, just how sophisticated and good they're getting it at making games and at running their companies um, is is fascinating. And uh, it's I think it's awesome. Like we have so much work to do in the game industry about things like crunch and quality of life, but seeing like the the work that's being done by developers and seeing like how many developers are getting it right today um, versus, you know, 10 years ago when I was in development is uh, it's just really, really gratifying. What's the reason for that? I think we're just I think so. I think a couple of reasons. One is I think like there's just better information sharing. So people know that, you know, oh, there's better ways to run a studio than than, you know, an eight month crunch cycle. And people also know like, oh, that's not cool, you know. And and I also think that, um, you know, we're just learning. You know, the whole industry is only, you know, 45 years old or something like that from the, you know, from Pong and uh, maybe 46 now. Um, and 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 the era of like like uh, independent, the modern era of independent developers is really only like 10 years old, right? I mean, there's there's teams like Insomniac and my, and my old studio that are like kind of the older independent developers, but the modern era of independent devs is, really kind of comes from 2008 forward. And so it's just a learning process. And I think as, as we all get better at things, like that permeates throughout the whole industry. And certainly there's still work to do. I'm sure we could go find a studio with, you know, not great working conditions, but we can also go out and find like studios that are with amazing working conditions and studios that are doing, you know, we just heard today at Dice Europe, like incredible things with distributed development and, you know, development situations that enable people to be involved in video game development and tell their story who just like literally couldn't have been in the game industry five years ago. And that's like, that's so cool. Is the then the term indie developer, is that changing for you? Yeah, I I mentioned before I used to be really into punk music, and so I, I spent like my whole twenties and teens arguing about like what was punk and what wasn't punk, and is this punk? Is Green Day punk? It's so um, it was really fun to talk about, but it's so it's really tedious too at the same time. So we don't even try and define it. Like mm. I used to actually have a thing on my office door that just said Indies with a buster through it because it's like just don't use the term you yeah. know what i mean we, we internally we just say developers okay and um i do think if, if you ask me to define indie development it all comes down to creative control if you have like full creative control over your project you're independent whether you're being funded by a publisher or self-funding or, or whatever but i think like it's so hard to define what an independent developer is today that it's just easier to say developers and certainly through the id program we have everything from you know one man one woman teams like all the way up to like huge studios that are technically you know because of the way microsoft you know does things like going working through the id program so it, it's just such a range just out of curiosity what is the largest developer not the name necessarily but the number of people with more than a thousand really yeah wow yeah i had no idea yeah scrappy little indies you know <laughs> <laughs> okay that's amazing uh so are any of your developers engaged in open development? In Meaning open as in we are from day one, we are sharing absolutely everything with our fans in terms of how this particular title is evolving. Yeah, I think there are some. Okay. How do yeah. you feel about that today? I, I think it's cool. I think it's a strategy and I think it works for some studios and doesn't work for other studios. I think if I was doing a studio again today, I would do that. Hmm. Like, you know, I would be, you know, there's some... I was just talking to a, a studio and they, you know, they're really, um, they had a big Kickstarter and big crowdfunding post Kickstarter and they're completely transparent, you know, almost to the 
point of having their Slack be public, you know, where they just talk about everything that's happening in development. And that's the way they're, you know, working with their community. I, I think it's really cool. I can kind of understand also the idea that you want to be stealth until you have something that you're ready to show. And I think it just comes down to like, um, you know, just what works for you as a studio and as a developer, like, and. I, but you also have a perspective from a larger publisher uh, realm when it comes to marketing and as you said discoverability yeah. right is there is there an advantage you think on the whole to being completely open from the beginning or, th- or in holding things back i think it changes right because right. like so you talk to some developers and you talk to some marketing folks who you know people who think about this all the time and you know there's right now there's this notion that like you should hold back um because you can go out and get press whenever you want uh, but if you don't have more to talk about, you know, closer to launch, then you might have trouble getting more press, you know, because suddenly you're an old story. Um, And then there's the, you know, the flip side of that, which is like, it's going to take you an incredibly long time uh, to, to reach your full audience potential. And, you know, the fact that Castle Crashers still sells really well, uh, you know, 11 years after its launch shows that like, even a game that that that's that big has still not reached its full market potential. And so to try and reach that full market potential, you should be talking about your game early and often and publicly and as much as humanly possible to so that everybody knows about it or as many people as possible know about it by the time it launches. And the thing is, I actually think both those things are true. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I think we're in a world where like there's a there's so many different ways for a game to be successful um, that, that like both those strategies like make sense and it just comes down to game to game. And I think it's one of the things that makes being an independent developer really, really difficult right now is that like you can look at like any strategy right now, whether it's like take money from an investor, find a publisher, bootstrap it, you know, talk about the game early, keep it quiet, stay in stealth mode. And you can point to like enormous number of successes using all those different methodologies. So like which one should you choose? Like that is a that's a question no one can answer for you. Well, I think you said it earlier. It really depends on the studio. So if you have people who are articulate and interested in sharing and always have something interesting to say and can generate stories about the game in development, maybe that's the perfect fit. Yeah. Right? If you have folks who really love being heads down and excluding everything else so they can make their you know, masterpiece, open development probably doesn't work. Yeah, I think so, that's exactly right. It's yeah, just, I was thinking about it more from the marketing perspective, but I think you're dead on it's what fits the studio yeah yeah absolutely and you can i think you can be successful anyway what's not going to be successful is to have a blog post that says here we're going to post about the game every week and that blog post is like (laughs) eight months old and there hasn't been another blog post like yeah that's that's, you got to be authentic with your fans for sure Um, that makes sense so what speaking of of fans you know one of the cool things that you guys have done is you're you're supporting games on multiple platforms it's not just Xbox One, right? I mean, you're on Windows 10, iOS, Android, right? Yeah, yeah. So Xbox and, Live is available all those places, right? Yeah, it's been it's been really cool. Like, it's been fun to work at Microsoft during this kind of um, opening period. I don't know what to what to call it, but uh, but w- what we've seen at Xbox is the more open we are, the more success we have. And so things like enabling crossplay and then enabling Xbox Live on iOS and Android, like all those things have just been made life easier for developers. And that ends up paying like a dividend with consumers as well. Yeah. What do you think that means going forward? So as we, as we look, because right now we are on the cusp of a whole bunch of stuff, right? Whether it's cloud streaming of games or new consoles, right? What's going to happen? I think that the... Well, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. I wish on, I knew what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. Tell um, us. But I think like our strategy is to really go from a player first model, right? Which is just to think as much as possible about what players want and how they want to behave and how they want to consume content and and interact with games and just try and do everything we can to like work from that model versus like a an engineering led model where you know, we're building this because we can build it and, you know, hopefully people will like it, you know, and, and so, um, yeah, I, again, I, I have no idea what's going to happen. And, you know, I talked about the world is complicated for developers. There's so many 
platforms out there. There's so many opportunities out there. It's uh, it's hard to know, but I do feel that like um, I feel good about our strategy. Um, you know, this player first model um, is something that you know is is I think is a is a legitimate strategy to pursue. Well, when it comes to consoles and cloud streaming, what does that mean when it, in regard to player first? So I think like for us, it's about making sure that you can play the I'm going to say the marketing slogan now, uh, you know, play the games you want with the people you want on the devices you want. Okay. And that really is like that informs like everything that we're doing right now. And so uh, I can't talk too much about X cloud cause it's, it's not my program or anything like that. But, but um, you know, I think that, that that's kind of like where our vision is on, on streaming and, and, and really with everything we do. Well, I'm going to ask you a more, maybe potentially a controversial question. Do you see a massive battle between Google and Microsoft coming up? No, I mean, I, well, I don't know. You know what? Like we can't, like, I think that when you're like a platform holder, you have to focus on doing what, what you think is best. And, you know, we've taken this player first model and we just had to work on executing on that as well as we can. We can't um, be looking into the other lanes. Like we have to just like know what we're doing and just, and just go forward. And so, you know, for, for us at ID, that's always been kind of like the way we've gone. And, you know, sometimes people ask like, well, what about indies on this platform or this platform? And it's like, I, you know, all the only thing we can do is just make publishing on Xbox as good as possible yeah. and, you know, talk to developers about what they want us to do on Xbox and and work on implementing that. And I think that the the competitive situation is kind of maybe it's above my pay grade, but it's just something where like, you know, I think that like we just need to focus on doing the best job we can for our developers and our players. And then that's all we can do. Do you see indie I shouldn't even use these words, independent developers changing over the next five years in any significant way. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think that um, we'll see, you know, you know, continued growth. We'll see um, new models of development that probably don't even exist right now. Like we're seeing that right now with distributed. We'll see other things. Um, you know, I think some of the stuff um, that, that they were talking about here at DICE about um, user generated content and user generated games. I think that's going to be a really interesting area of development for devs. Um, at the same time, I don't think any of the existing models are going to go away. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to continue to see, you know, games from single auteur developers, you know, you know, break through and, you know, become big hits. We're going to see, you know, um, games at the five person size, you know, five person team size, a 12 person team size, a 20 person team size, you know, continue to exist. Um, I do think, and maybe this is controversial opinion, I do think there's like islands of successful development methodologies. Like I don't think every development methodology um, is necessarily going to be um, as successful as every other one. And what I mean by that is that you can easily get in over your head on a, a game development. You can take, you know, say there's a game type that, you know, you know is going to have, you, know, you can look at the sales on Steam Spy or other places and kind of understand the window of what your, your best case and your worst case is. You can probably find somebody to give you enough investment to, you know, to put too big of a team on a game. And, you know, to create a game that probably has no realistic chance of, like, returning on investment. And so um, so I think there are some, like, like islands of development. And, and I don't know if this is all fully fleshed out enough for me to, to, to talk about in this podcast. But, but say you're making, um, like, a, uh, a side-scrolling platformer, which is a, you know, pretty established game style right now. Um, if you do that game with one person or a five person team, like I think you can have like a really good return on investment. If you put like a hundred person team or 40 person team on a side scrolling platformer, um, it better be a really good side scrolling platformer, um, you know, for you to hope to, to recoup on that investment, which I think is possible, but, but it, it gets harder and harder the bigger that team size gets. So I do think there's kind of unsustainable um, development um, sort of things that you can do. Um, and to me, that's like a, that's like the thing that kind of, um, bums me out more than anything else in the game industry right now is that like, uh, unsustainability. And, you know, I, I look at, you know, um, you know, companies that friends have, or, you know, companies that have been around a really long time and that, you know, I love that, you know, like a company that's been around for 
for 20 years um, is, is really interesting to me. And, you know, Dave Lang um, from Iron Galaxy just said it a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about why I founded Iron Galaxy. And he was like, I think what he said was, I just wanted to make a company where I could work with my friends for the rest of my life. And I was like, that is awesome. And, you know, that is a great way to do a company. And so a lot of what we do at ID, I think, is around the notion of helping developers reach sustainability where they, you know, you may not want to run a dev studio or work at a dev studio for the rest of your life. But if you want to, we want to give you all the tools so that you can, mm -hmm. you know, so that you can have that kind of level of sales success that you need to keep making your art and keep doing what you love to do for as long as you want to do it. And um, so, yeah, so I, I do think there's kind of like team sizes that are good islands of stability for, for different kinds of genres and game type. And, um, and so it makes me happy when I see those games succeed. And it does bum me out when I see somebody doing something where I feel like, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, people should do whatever they want. Um, but you know, when I see something that's unsustainable, it's kind of like, it's sort of, it's sort of sad. That's excellent advice. So is there any other advice that you might give uh, somebody who's been passionate about jumping into games and hasn't taken that next step? I mean, I think the advice I'd give to developers now who are just jumping in is like, first of all, you have to have a good game, right? Like every piece of advice that anybody gives you in the game industry is predicated on the idea that your game is really, really good. And, um, Kind of hard to know, though, it, if it you're is just hard about to, to jump in, it is right? Hard to you've know. got this, you want to get into games, yeah. but you don't know exactly what it is you want to make. Yeah, it's tricky. And I think, like, you can't necessarily assume that your first game is going to be a breakout hit. Okay. Like, you know, a, a advice I'd give to somebody getting into games today is try and make the, you know, trying to make the first game sustainably or cheaply so that you can, you know, s learn the things that you don't even know you need to learn to make your second game more successful, I think is is good advice. And I've seen some, um, you know, bummer situations of one and done developers who, who get in, um, don't, don't have the success that they're hoping for, and then just leave the game industry. And that's sad. I mean, games aren't for everyone. It is a hit driven business It is a tough business and, and maybe it isn't for everyone, but I do think I've seen people leave the industry too soon. Um, and, um, and who still have something to offer and something to say. Um, and it, it bums me out. Um, but the other advice I just always give people, and it's such like mundane advice, but I think it's really important, is the amount that somebody who's making a digital game needs to focus on their box art is ridiculously high. And I know this is super silly, but like no matter how much work you do promoting your game beforehand, no matter how many views your YouTube videos get, most of the people who are going to buy your game will encounter it for the first time in the new releases section of a store whether it's Steam, whether it's PlayStation, whether it's Xbox, whether it's, you know, Switch, like most of the people who are going to see that game see it first in new releases. And if that box art is bad, they just move to the next one. Now, how do you determine bad? It doesn't get a lot of clicks, right? Right. And, 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 and so, yeah. But again, let's, say, let's say I'm a developer who's never created box art or, or yeah. some representative in, image of my game. How do I learn what is good and what's bad. So I think you just have to get on the markets. You just have to start your PlayStation or start your Switch or start your Xbox or go on Steam and don't just look at like what, and, and look at what looks good. Mm -hmm. Like look at what's been successful, see if you can derive anything from the success of others, but also just look at what what images arrest you and what images like don't don't get you. And it's different for every platform, right? It's like the, the PlayStation store is different than the Xbox store. The box art is a different size on screen. And that's actually important. The Switch store is completely different and is different if you're holding your, I mean, it's the same store, but you know, your, your impression of the box art is different if you're holding your Switch versus if you're looking at it on your TV. Steam is a different experience. Again, it's like a two foot experience versus a 10 foot experience. I always tell devs, um, you know, if you, if you, you, you can display, you know, digital images on your TV with an SD card and like do that and like, mock up like the the you know take a screenshot of the stores like put your box art in there and like how does that actually look how does it stand out and like what's good and what's bad is hard to determine but you know having the fonts be too small like having the having the image be like you know a, an image that's really intricate intricate sorry i can't talk um may look great on steam because you're really physically close to it and so your eyes can derive all the detail it might not work on xbox or playstation because the box art's just farther away 
Um, so you might need something that's just bolder. I tell people to look at like, look at the profile shapes that are going to be on the screen um, or on the box and just like things that are just like that work and look at what the big companies do. You know, companies like, you know, big publishers have lots of money that they invest in making sure their box art is awesome. Are there lessons there that you can learn? Like I would, I would really, you know, think about that. And then the other advice we always give everyone on Xbox is like, don't use a sexy image because we just won't promote it. Like if you have some gross, you know, uh, overly sexualized image on your box art, like you're done. Like we, we don't promote it at all. So, um, and I can also tell you that while that sometimes gets clicks, uh, maybe because people want to see the box art bigger, it doesn't at all lead to sales. Hmm. Like it, you know, and maybe, maybe that's not true other places. I can only speak for Xbox, but yeah. Um, so the box art is a big one. And then the screenshots are another big one. Like it just like it, it killed me when I was a journalist, when I got bad screenshots and it still kills me now um, to see bad screenshots. And like, these are like the, the back of your box. These are the things that are going to, you know, somebody's already seen the box and liked it enough to click in. And like, now you got to sell it. You got to like get that, mouse pointer over the buy now button and i can't tell you how many times i've just seen like a screenshot of like the the like the options menu is like you know and on xbox we rotate the screens like you don't pick like a, a prime screen like it just it's a carousel and so like you need every screenshot to be like amazing and like i think a lot of developers you know you I, I i totally get this you're in the middle of development you're at the end you're just trying to get the game out and it's so easy to just like hit the space bar five times as fast as possible to take screens and be like i'm done ship it and then like you've just like killed half your sales and you don't even know it and so like i i just always encourage people like take a day, hire a friend, like do something, but you want every screenshot to be like the most evocative, enticing screen possible. Cause that's, what's gonna like on the marketplace turn into sales. Have you, if you had to pick one game that has done an excellent job within uh, ID at Xbox with box art and with screenshots, what would it be? So it's pro I, the one I always, I used to show this a lot in, in talks is uh, the arc survival evolved screen. Because it had um, the the screenshot just had uh, uh, a lady holding a machine gun riding a T Rex, and then there's this weird sci fi tower in the background. It reads really well in profile, and it just tells you everything you need to know about the game. Like you're going to be riding a T Rex, you can make a machine, or you don't even know it's a you know a survival building game, but you just it just it just sell it, you just want to know more, and so it's really easy to click in. And then the the piece of art that that um, uh, that is taken from actually shows like a, a dude on a different dinosaur also holding a machine gun. So then, you know, it's multiplayer and it's like that, that is like a really evocative screen. I'm not saying like putting a dinosaur in every screen, you know, in every box art is like the thing to do Although I don't know, might not hurt, but, uh, but that one's just really, really good. <laughs> That's great. I, I gotta go look at that. I, I kind of remember it kind of don't. So I, I'll have to, research it yeah just to make sure. when you but, when you see it it's it's pretty it's pretty good but you know it's, for, for me it's, it's fascinating that you bring this up because we've been talking about box art for 20 plus years right but now it's digital box art and now the parameters are even more all over the place given what you said about the different stores the digital stores so it's it's it, i wouldn't have expected you to bring that up it's a yeah it's not what you think about right because yeah. you just you you if you're a game maker, I think, you know, you really just think oh, I'm just gonna make this game as good as possible and the rest of it's gonna take care of itself. But well, like, well, yeah, we're mostly thinking about the yeah. trailers that we're putting out on yeah. YouTube and not necessarily. But trailer's crucial too, because the trailer, at least on Xbox now, will just autoplay the second you go to the game's details page. And so you need to make the trailer like really, really nice. Of course, but but you're right. That box, I mean, people remember that image yeah. and they associate it with your game and that's super powerful. So that's excellent advice. So last question. Uh, looking ahead, what's the thing you're most excited about for the next five years? Wow, that's a good question. I, I'll answer it the same same way I always think about this. I, the thing I'm most excited about is a game that's going to come from left field that you just like nobody was thinking about and just like knocks your socks off because you know there's going to be one out there. Um, you know, the Cuphead was the one that nobody could have predicted at the start of ID. I know that right now in development someplace, there's a game that's just so bonkers, you know, that it's going to just like, uh, it's just going to blow us all away. So that's what I'm most excited about is like finding that next one. And, you know, just like just seeing 
like in such a lucky position, whether I was a journalist or now, just getting to see like so many games and like learn all the the stories behind them. Sometimes those stories don't even, you know, get get told, don't even make it into public. But I'm sure you know these two, like, you know, just a story of a dev who like either worked really hard or came from, you know, like a difficult circumstance and then like, you know, gets to the point where they ship their game and kind of realize their dreams. To me that like that is like so exciting. And it makes me like so stoked to see the games. But just just a you know, I mentioned before I have like a pretty short attention span and just getting to see like all these different games and play so many different games is just like it's just a you know, it's like you're a dog with your nose out the car window just smelling everything going by. <laughs> you know, it's just like it's just a rush and I just I love it. That's fantastic. If people have questions about ID at Xbox or anything at all, can they contact you? Yeah, sure. So you can either, um, if you want to go to the ID at Xbox website, uh, which you should do if you're a dev, it's just xbox.com slash ID. Um, if you want to email ID at Xbox, uh, you can just, it's just ID at xbox.com, which uh, is cool because it, it's, uh, it's a, at Microsoft, you're not supposed to have a two letter email address, but we got one. So it's exciting. Um, and then if they want to reach me, uh, probably the best way to do it is just on Twitter. And it's just um, IOCAT. So I-O-C-A-T. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us for the Game Makers Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.